Uh, the last speaker in this panel uh, will be Dr. Amiali Ramos. Dr. Ramos is the International Policy Coordinator for the ICCA Consortium. Amiali has been working with Indigenous and local communities since 2002 on issues related to governance, conservation, safeguards, livelihoods, and rights. She's worked to strengthen the collective capacity of Indigenous peoples in global environmental processes like the CBD, the UNFCCC, IFES, and ITCC. Her work really focuses on exploring these interlinkages between global environmental issues and Indigenous knowledge systems and highlighting the role that traditional knowledge can play in developing sustainable solutions for our most pressing global environmental challenges. Welcome, Dr. Ramos. I'll hand it over to you now. Hola, buenos dias, buenas tardes, buenas noches. Thank you so much for having me here today. Don Hill Adams, an indigenous woman from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma says, and I quote, indigenous people are a land-based people. Nothing we do makes any sense or has any impact if it's taken off the ground. A land-based people. Just take a moment there. I'd like to invite everyone to reflect. A land-based people. A land-based people whose identities are intimately woven with the land, spiritual beings, and other species. These are some examples, next slide please, of those lands and these land-based people who on a daily basis care for the land. They conserve the land. They coexist with and for the land, the waters and all of the life within them. These are territories of life. The territories of life and their custodians play an outsized role in the governance, conservation, and sustainable use of the world's biodiversity and nature. These custodians actively protect and conserve an astounding diversity of globally relevant species, habitats, and ecosystems. They provide the basis for clean water, clean air, healthy food, livelihoods for people far beyond their boundaries. My name is Amiali Ramos, and I am the International Policy Coordinator for the ICCA Consortium. And yes, I am aware that this is a symposium on OECMs, and I promise I will get to that. But before I do, I wanted to remind you, remind us all, that these territories of life and their custodians exist and are actively contributing to our planet and our collective well-being on a daily basis, regardless of international designations, regardless of policy frameworks, regardless of whether these lands are labeled as protected areas, as OECMs, as indigenous protected areas, as community conserved areas, as territories of life. These territories and their custodians are there every day doing conservation, doing life. And indeed, perhaps, one of the biggest opportunities to catalyze transformative changes is to support custodian communities to secure their human rights in general, and particularly their respective rights to self-determination and governance systems, cultures, and collective lands and territories. Which brings me to the topic of symposium today, and I'm so happy to have been able to listen to all of the presentations previously. For now, operationalizing OECMs, and what are the possible opportunities and challenges that this specific framework offers to custodians in their territories of life. And so I start with a question, are OECMs an opportunity to catalyze this type of transformative change? Well, to get to this, we'd like to share some of the work that we've been doing. Um, and I think before that even, we need to take a closer look at the framework and acknowledge that there are no guarantees about implementation at the national and subnational levels. No matter how clear the international guidance is, no matter how clear the academic papers are on OECMs, there's just no guarantees about how this will be implemented. And as many others have shared, OECMs are a relatively new framework that have the potential to usher in a new phase of conservation law and policy that is more inclusive, equitable, and rights-based. We at the ICCA Consortium and also at IUCNC have been closely following these parts of the discussions and would like to, to share some experiences from both duty bearers and right holders, from custodians on how OECMs are currently being operationalized in their national contexts. So for today, specifically, we'd like to share some perspectives from government officials, 
These are based on case studies conducted by the IUCN Commission on Environment, Economic, and Social Policy, and especially to really bright young women, Amelia and Alejandra, who are pulling this together. We will also like to share some perspectives from custodian communities and their supporting organizations based on the experiences to date within the ICCA consortium membership. Overall, I think we would all agree that these groups have very different roles and very different lenses through which they are scrutinizing OECMs. But there are strikingly similarities in the issues they foresee or are already facing with early stage efforts to operationalize OECMs. And we'd like to highlight three issues in particular. The first issue, and this is something that Andrew just spoke about in his presentation, we're realizing that there is a very high cost to operationalizing OECMs in accordance with the CBD decisions and IUCN guidance, even where there is a huge amount of political will and desire to do so, as in Andrew's presentation speaks to this. Everyone seems to have a different understanding of what OECMs are, with very few engaging with the actual content of the COP decision or IUCN guidance. The reality is it takes a huge amount of time, a huge amount of resources to change the relevant government agencies from within so that they have the capacity to critically engage with this framework and undertake the necessary work to operationalize it properly. So again, we saw the example that Andrew just presented from Mexico, and there were others in the symposium previously. We've also seen examples in Peru where this process for recognition started at the end of 2018, and the process is still ongoing four years later. They're trying to implement their own OECM definition and criteria to identify potential areas. We see something similar in India, where there's a comprehensive systematization of ongoing initiatives, and it's just a really long and arduous process to try and get some clarity about this. For rights holders, this means an added obstacle to even engaging with the OECM frameworks if governments themselves are trying to figure it out and operationalize it. And in the meantime, what does this mean for right holders? Which brings us to the second key finding here. Not only do indigenous people and local communities face significant practical barriers to identify and reporting their conserved territories and areas, but there are also limited material benefits and incentives for them to do so. Again, Heather mentioned this just previously in her presentation. What is the added value for legal recognition to support or defend against harmful industries perhaps? In effect, communities' contributions to this OECM framework would be counted, counted, for the benefit of national and international conservation targets without receiving any counterpart recognition and support. The ICCA consortium has been raising this concern about OECMs for more than five years in the CBD process. There are a myriad of examples, but here I'd like to um, just highlight two. One of them is every time we bring up the concept of OECMs with our ICCA consortium memberships, they ask OECMs, but ICCAs were the thing before. Why would we report our lands as OECMs now? Um, another very, very often question we get is, how, how will this help us do the work that we're doing on the ground? Will this label help us achieve something new? That's a very common question we get. We're also seeing that there's very tokenistic participation in terms of getting indigenous people engaged, and this makes the process even more complicated. Another one key finding that we'd like to share today is that there is a very high likelihood, unfortunately, of further entrenching existing concerns. And this is something that Joji raised earlier today. State-centric conservation policies and laws, particularly in countries where national frameworks do not provide appropriate recognition and support for indigenous peoples and local communities and custodians, this raises a huge risk of entrenching existing concerns about protected areas. I'll give a couple of examples. In India, communities and their supporting civil society organizations have been marginalized and excluded from the very process to develop the country's specific framework and guidance on OECMs. Despite India having a really progressive law, the Forest Rights Act, its implementation is significantly hampered by prevailing attitudes and approaches in government and agencies, where the painful legacy of exclusionary conservation continues. We also see this in Colombia. And we see something very interesting, for instance, in Eswatini, that's one of the few countries that has reported an OECM under indigenous governance, um, that actually indigenous peoples are not recognized by the government as such. They're only recognized as 
local communities. So there's a lot of discrepancy there. Uh, but more broadly, and I think this is really very, very, very important, is that indigenous and community perspectives underscore that only when viewed through the lens of international conservation frameworks, particularly protected areas or OECMs, communities' contributions to a diverse and healthy planet are instrumentalized and conditional. Instrumentalized and conditional without recognition of the extraordinary challenges and disruptions they are facing. It also fragments and disembodies the very foundation that enables them to contribute so much to conservation. There's no recognition for the very intricate relationship between people and land. Remember, a land-based people. Again, this is something that Georgie very, very eloquently referred to earlier. It's not just conservation for indigenous peoples. It implies a governance system, a way of life, spiritual beliefs, kinship with those beyond humankind. This is something critical. And although there have been important advances in conservation and protected area law and policy over the past 20 years, many indigenous peoples and local communities are extremely wary with the right of new concepts and frameworks that have grown out of the very closely linked protected area system. There is a lot of distrust there. Despite the best intentions of proponents of OECMs, it is imperative to acknowledge and understand this historical and ongoing legacy, while also looking ahead to see what can be done for the future. So in my community, we have a rule that when we voice challenges, we also try and voice some potential solutions. So here with our membership and with the community around IUCNCs, we've tried to come up with some very, very concrete recommendations for how to move things forward. Number one, here let me move this. Support indigenous peoples, local communities, and their organizations to critically engage with in-country processes. This is essential. And this must be done in the context of their broader self-determined priorities. So what does this mean? First of all, it means we need to learn to listen, to listen very closely. We need methodologies that allow for real and meaningful community co-creation, which is something Lara, Lara said earlier in her presentation. We also need accessible technical analysis of policy and legal frameworks. We need to respect and support community self-determined priorities, even when these do not necessarily align with conservation, NGO interests, and or government policies. And Anne Larson said it really well today when we went in her presentation. She said, we should be asking custodians to consent to our ideas, not the other way around. And indeed, indigenous communities local communities and their organizations should be the ones leading this process and we should be supporting. So for this to happen, we call on government agencies to strengthen their in-house capacity to understand and engage with communities in a respectful and rights affirming way. This might entail a process of unlearning and also requires a great amount of political will, capacity building and adequate technical and financial resources. OECMs might be an opportunity to establish new dialogues and relationships, but it has to be done respectfully and in a rights affirming way. This is critical. And as Andrew presented with what's going on in Mexico, it takes a lot of time, a lot of willingness, a lot of political will, a lot of resources and a lot of unlearning. But we know governments can do this, so we call upon you to do it. Funders, money talks. Funders have a big role to play in these discussions, a huge one actually. And we call on you to require human rights safeguards and accountability mechanisms in funding related to OCMs, especially when funding goes to large conservation organizations or government agencies. You have a great deal of leverage to really shift the dial on how OECMs could be and should be operationalized step into that space with confidence. We're counting on you to do it. And finally, to the conservation community, now is the time to recognize custodians' contributions to nature conservation on their own terms and in their own right 
including beyond protected areas and OECMs. Many of you are likely following the post-2020 negotiations and have seen the latest report from the informal group where they have included a placeholder in target three as a third pathway of recognition beyond protected areas and OECMs. This in itself will not solve everything, and it's still within the context and confines of target three. However, it is a critical step forward in an evolving legal and policy landscape. It opens up more opportunities for custodians and territories of life to determine for themselves how they wish to be recognized and supported in the context of conservation. And this is key. It opens the opportunity to recognize for themselves how they wish to be supported. For those who strive to support conservation through NGOs, governments, funders, or otherwise, this is not only an opportunity, but also a responsibility. Let's embrace this and play our part in supporting custodians and their territories of life to secure the recognition and support they deserve for the critical roles they play in sustaining a healthy planet for all. Thank you very much.